Well, thank you very much. Again, my name is Renee Bradshaw, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today, Five Insider Tips, Using IT Audits to Maximize Security. Today, we're very excited to have as our guest speaker, Mr. Mike Chappell, the Senior Director for Enterprise Support Services at the University of Notre Dame. Today, Mike will identify and discuss five key tips to help you get the most out of your next audit. You'll leave here today with a clear idea of how to leverage your IT audit process to achieve your compliance objectives and improve your organization's security posture. But before getting into the agenda and introducing Mike formally, just a few housekeeping notes. As I mentioned earlier, at the end of the presentation, we've set aside time for Q&A. We're looking forward to hearing from you, and so please stick with us and join us for that section of the presentation at the end. Also, shortly before we end the Q&A session, you'll have the opportunity to complete a survey for us, and most importantly, in doing that, enter for a chance to win an Apple iPad, so you don't want to miss that opportunity. Please stick around. On to, on to the agenda. First on the agenda today will be our guest speaker. Mike will present to us an insider's guide to effective audit. Too often, IT auditors, frankly, are seen as a hindrance, and the audit itself as a chore to be disposed of quickly. This type of a checkbox mentality to the IT audit process and compliance itself can lead to costly data breaches because compliance alone is not going to keep your environment secure. Only sound security principles and controls implemented in an effective and lasting manner are the key to an improved security posture. Compliance should be as a result of good security. So today, Mike's going to demonstrate to you how you can develop these sound security controls and IT practices, as well as streamline your compliance efforts by following a few simple steps to increase the effectiveness of your IT audit process. Then I'll wrap up with a short summary and discussion on how to leverage your audit findings to identify the right security controls, tools, and frameworks to improve the efficiency and security of your computing environment while e easing your compliance burden and, very importantly, meeting your business objectives. Finally, we'll end with the Q&A and the chance to win the Apple iPad. Okay, and with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Mike Chappell. Mike, as I said before, is the Senior Director for Enterprise Support Services at the University of Notre Dame. In this role, he oversees the information security, IT architecture, project management, strategic planning, and communications functions for the Office of Information Technology. Mike also serves as an assistant professor in the university's computer apps department, where he teaches an undergraduate course on information security. He has a varied background, which includes being the Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer at the Brand Institute. He also spent four years in the Information Security Research Group at the National Security Agency and served as an active duty intelligence officer in the U.S. Air Force. He's a published author, including the best-selling CISSP Certified Information Systems Security Professional Study Guide. He earned both his bachelor's and doctoral degrees from Notre Dame in computer science and engineering, and he also holds a master's in computer science from the University of Idaho and an MBA from Auburn. As an information security professional with over 10 years of experience in government, the private sector, and higher education, Mike is a recognized thought leader in the field of information security management. We are very happy to have him here with us today, and we hope that you find your time with him just as valuable as we have here at NetIQ. And now, without any further delay, I will turn it over to Mike. Well, thank you, Renee, and thank you for inviting me to join you this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with everyone and to have the opportunity to share some of my perspectives on the value of IT auditing. And that's right, I chose the word value deliberately. You know, I firmly believe that if they're taken in the right spirit and the proper amount of preparation, audits and assessments can be an exceptionally valuable part of your information security program. And I've worked, walked into a lot of organizations who are about to face an audit and heard some pretty discouraging types of comments. You know, you've probably heard some of these yourself, things like, oh, my gosh, the auditors are coming, or be careful, don't offer any details that the auditors don't specifically ask you for, or in some cases it even goes so far as you hear things like, you know, they're out to get us, be careful. So I think that for the most part, these fears are unfounded. IT audits, when, when they're done in that correct spirit, really have only one purpose, and that's to make sure that an organization's security controls are both designed well and functioning properly. 
Now, audits are performed by different people and for different target audiences. You know, sometimes you have internal auditors who are producing audits that are purely for an internal audience. Sometimes you have external auditors producing audits that are going to go to a, a board of directors or regulatory agencies. But in all of those cases, I think that you shouldn't see audits really as a pop quiz. Right? They, they are a test. There's no, no mistaking it. Audits are there and exist to test security controls. But they're a test where you know all of the questions in advance. So as a professor, I couldn't resist the analogy to testing, but it's, you know, when, when, a, when a professor gives you that test where you know all of the questions, sometimes it makes it a little more difficult to prepare for, but at least you know what's coming. So in this webcast, I'm going to describe how you can use five practical tips to extract the maximum value from your audit experience. So the first one of those is something that I hope you are all thinking about already, and it's treating audits as a life cycle process. And what this basically means is that you're never going to be finished. At any point in time, if you're not preparing for an audit or remediating deficiencies in your security controls, you should be assessing your readiness. So the reason for this life cycle type of approach is the very dynamic nature of modern IT environments. And if you take a minute to think about your own IT shop, just reflect on the changes that have occurred. How much has it changed in your environment in just the last few weeks, let alone the year or so that might have passed since you've had your last audit? If you don't take this kind of life cycle approach to audit preparation, you'll find yourself in a very sorry state of affairs, the kind of situation where you're constantly rushing to prepare for the next audit, but you never really have the time to step back and have confidence in the reliability of your security controls. Now, that's definitely not a good place to be, and it's a situation that I call treating audits like your Super Bowl. Now, um, if you think about all the different industries we're in, we all have these kind of Super Bowl events. And yes, uh, for those of you who are paying careful attention, this is not a picture of the Super Bowl. It's a picture of a football game at Notre Dame, so I had to throw a little team spirit in there. But, but we have these events no matter what our industry is. Uh, one that just passed you know, is Tax Day, April 15th or April 18th this year. is big in, in many uh, financial fields and other places. In public corporations, we have a Super Bowl event that occurs around the end of the fiscal year when we're trying to get our, our reporting finalized. Nonprofit organizations, uh, such as the one I work in, receive a lot of donations. And we have a Super Bowl at the end of December. While, every, while all of our donors are trying to rush to get their tax deductions in before that artificial deadline uh, approaches. Another one we have in higher ed is that the kind of the frenzied struggle that occurs to tabulate grades during the week between the last day of final exams and the awarding of diplomas at commencement. Now, as in those examples, many of these Super Bowls are imposed upon us, and we just need to buckle down and get our work done. But I really believe that you shouldn't let IT audits become Super Bowl events. So let me give you an example. Um, as Renee mentioned, earlier in my career, I was an Air Force officer. And those of you with military backgrounds know that the military equivalent of an audit is we call them inspections. And the inspector general is the independent auditor who comes in to inspect your records and assess readiness and things like that. Well, one unit that I was in certainly didn't follow this life cycle model. Instead, every year, about two weeks before the inspector general and his team showed up for, the, for this predictable announced visit, the, the unit commander was going to go berserk in a staff meeting. We, we all knew it was coming. That was kind of our, that was our life cycle. The, the, the commander would go berserk two weeks before, start issuing orders that the records be straightened and the equipment reviewed, and that everybody go through everything with a fine-tooth comb to make sure that there was, and I'll put air quotes around this, nothing for the IG to find. So as you might be imagining, this didn't go very well. Every year the IG showed up and made some glaring observations about how things were not running properly. And every year the commander gave the same lecture about how the unit must not have prepared well during the two weeks before the audit. So in this case, he simply didn't get it. An audit should not be something that you rush around to prepare for, but an event that culminates a year of solid work. So that unit clearly treated the audit as a Super Bowl. So continuing the Super Bowl analogy a little bit, you can avoid a mad rush to prepare your organization for an audit by using the off-season wisely following an audit life cycle model. So if you shouldn't treat an audit like a Super Bowl, what can we compare it to? Well, the analogy I prefer is treating an audit like a visit to the doctor's office. 
So hopefully when the time comes for your annual physical, and hopefully you're all having annual physicals, but hopefully when this time rolls around, you're not going on a crash diet two weeks prior to the exam to impress your doctor. Right? Instead, what we hope is happening is that your trip to the physician is about monitoring and surveillance. So during your visit, your doctor probably is going to interview you to get a sense of the general state of your health. She might ask you about your diet and exercise habits, maybe any unusual symptoms you might be experiencing, your compliance with medications you're expected to take, any other similar issues. Now that said, she knows that when we're questioned, all of us have a natural tendency to exaggerate the healthiness of our lifestyles. So your doctor isn't just going to take your word for it when you say that you're living a healthy life. She's going to supplement her interview with some quantitative measures of your health. You'll be weighed, you'll have your blood pressure taken, maybe some lab work done. All of these objective measures can then be compared to your past history. And together, they can flesh out a useful picture of your life cycle. If you have gone on a crash diet and managed to lose a few pounds, your weight might drop, but your cholesterol figure from your blood tests might betray that secret. So audits are quite similar. If your IT systems and processes are healthy, the interviews and the objective measures of your controls are just assessments of the state of your program, and you'll have nothing to worry about. If you've gone on a crash compliance program, it's probably going to fall apart at some point. So I've mentioned a few times that you should treat auditing like a life cycle process. So here on the screen, you can see an illustration of that life cycle model. Now notice that as a cycle, of course, it has no beginning and no end. And this is exactly the way you should treat your control assessments as you're getting ready for audits. While a, an auditor's visit might be time bound, you should always be working through this life cycle at some phase. So when you're in the prepare stage, you're identifying the IT security control objectives that make sense in your business situation. Now notice they said you are selecting the control objectives. A common misconception is that auditors make this decision, but that's not the way it should work. This should actually be the responsibility of management. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. In the assess stage, you're basically conducting your own internal audit. I found that things tend to go easier if you refer to these as assessments rather than audits, because that term audit tends to creep everybody out a little bit. So if you can avoid that and leave that for the auditors, it's, it's a good thing. So essentially during this stage, you're taking the control objectives and the audit standards that are being used and kind of walking the organization through the audit process. Remember, it's a test where we know the questions in advance. So you're taking the question, the question list that you have that the auditors are going to use, and making sure that you know all the answers, that, you can, that you're going to get an A. You're doing this without the uh, benefit of an auditor looking over your shoulder. So if you've identified your scope well, this should raise any red flags internally before the auditors show up and raise them externally. So then the remediate stage is where we can reconcile any gaps. So if we've noticed discrepancies between the control objectives and reality during our assessments, we can then go and take whatever actions we need to take to make sure that we've filled those gaps and remediated those deficiencies before we wind up having auditors on site. So you'll also notice here that I placed audit in the middle, and I didn't actually make the audit itself part of the life cycle. So while audits are normally scheduled well in advance, and they're, there's r rarely a surprise audit, though they do happen in some, in some industries, following a life cycle process should have you prepared so that you can be audited at any time, regardless of where you are in this process of assessments. So moving on to the second tip. This, uh, this is the idea that you must clearly understand the scope of an audit before you begin. And within this, I'd like to discuss three different components about understanding scope. The first is understanding the devices covered by an assessment. The second is knowing the business processes that are being audited. And then finally, it's agreeing upon the standards that are going to be used. So I'd like to introduce this maybe by giving you an example of a case where I completely blew it on this front once, and then hopefully you can learn from that experience that I had. 
So I was once working for an IT shop in an organization who had a, a relatively new internal audit function. They were trying to get their, their feet on the ground, and the, the processes of the audits themselves weren't really that mature yet. We just didn't know how our relationship with them and how we should work together. So the auditors approached us and let us know that they wanted to conduct an audit and they wanted to use a new application that our developers had just created. And the purpose of this application, it was involved in cash flow management. So it was helping our, our treasury folks move cash around. So the application didn't actually move the cash, but it was responsible for doing some of the modeling that they depended upon as they were trying to figure out where to place cash. So during our kickoff meeting, the auditors talked about some of the reasons they selected this system. First, that it was a critical part of our decision-making process. It also used some new technology, and then they had several other reasons that they thought this would be a good target for an audit. So we, we walked out of that meeting with the distinct impression, based upon the conversations we had and the questions that they asked, that the auditors were going to be mostly looking at the security controls in the system itself, so how the system implements security. Well, wow, were we ever wrong. <laughs> One, and we didn't find this out until we got the first draft of the audit report. And that report fo focused almost exclusively on the software development lifecycle. The details of the system itself were almost irrelevant to the audit. Instead, the auditors focused on the way we developed software and the way we managed the project around the development of that software. And th this caught everybody completely by surprise. And of course, it left us with an egg on our face because that was not the audit that we had all prepared for. So our mistake here was that we hadn't agreed on the scope of the audit. And preferably, we should have done that in writing prior to getting underway. So let's talk about those different areas where we want to understand the scope. The first is the devices that are being covered, the servers, the switches, all of the stuff that's being assessed as part of the audit. And in some cases, this is straightforward, but in other cases, there could be some clear confusion. Well, I guess there's no such thing as clear confusion. There should be some confusion around that. Now, uh, something that's important to point out is that scope reduction is a strategy used by many organizations to limit the applicability of regulatory requirements. So that's something that's very important to, to know as you go into an audit and as you try to figure out what the scope should be. So as an example, here at Notre Dame, we've built a standalone network for all of our systems that are involved in the processing of credit cards. So those of you who've worked with uh, PCI DSS before know that the, uh, th this is a pretty common strategy to take all of, your, all of your covered stuff and put it in a box, sort of, so you're limiting the, the, the reach of the standard. So this network that we've built is a completely self-contained infrastructure and we've designed it in such a way so that it doesn't have dependencies on other resources that are on campus. And now it does do some transmission of traffic over the network, but that's all encrypted. So we've gone to extreme measures here and to quite a bit of expense for the purpose of reducing our scope of PCI DSS compliance. And, and this reduces that burden. As I mentioned, those of you who've worked there know that it worked in PCI, know that the, the standard is quite long and it's, there, there's quite a burden of reporting and monitoring. So, and this is especially difficult in the open computing environment that we have in higher education. So when we're audited for PCI DSS compliance, whether it's uh, by our bank or by our internal auditors, or God forbid if we have a, a situation down the road, it's extremely important to us to spend time with the auditors before they get underway. And we want to make sure that they understand these controls, the things that we've put in place to contain credit card information to the special purpose network, and that they have a clear understanding that the scope of the audit, the devices and systems that should be covered by the audit, should be limited to this environment that we've built, and, it sh and, it, and making sure they understand and validate the controls that we've put in place to protect the rest of our network from those compliance requirements. So the second piece of this is business processes. So business, we have to figure out what business processes might be covered by the audit that's underway. So this is going to vary greatly, and it depends upon your industry and your operating environment and the type of audit that's being done. But you can imagine there are, there are all sorts of different things that it might include. So if you're in a, any kind of retail environment, it might include point-of-sale transactions like you see here. It might involve your user provisioning process or, the, or how you get rid of users, your termination process for employees who leave the organization. Or maybe it's the access privilege requests, how you do ads, changes, and deletes for access control permissions. 
or even your hardware decommissioning process. When you have a, a system that once contained sensitive data, how do you take it out of service and make sure that the, the, the media is sanitized before you dispose of it? So it's important as you begin an audit engagement to understand the business processes that the auditors are going to be covering. And this is really a critical part of preparing for, for that audit to take place. Then the next piece is standards. And you can see here there's a, there, there are a wide variety of standards that an audit might cover. I've listed a few, but the, depending upon the industry you're in, you're probably aware of a whole lot of more. So it's critical that you understand the standard that auditors are going to be using when they assess your environment. And I think, in you know, my experience, this is probably the number one area where audits go off track when there's a misunderstanding between the auditor and the auditee on the standard. So audit standards are generally written in a, a very detailed manner. Sometimes they prescribe specific tests that the auditor should perform to, to verify the presence and effectiveness of security controls. And uh, again, I'll go back to PCI DSS for an example. This, is, this standard is one of the most precise. It has very detailed testing procedures for each one of the requirements. So um, those of you who are familiar with it know that one of the requirements, it's actually requirement 8.5.9 of PCI DSS, requires that organizations ensure that user passwords are changed at least every 90 days. Now, this might seem straightforward. It's a pretty basic requirement, but the audit procedures go into much more detail, and they spell out the tests that the auditor should perform to verify that. So in, in this case, the audit procedure for PCI DSS says that for a sample of system components, you should obtain and inspect system configuration settings to verify that user password parameters are set to require users to change their passwords at least every 90 days. So it, it goes into, it doesn't say, you know, interview users to find out how often they've changed their password or try to change a password or anything like that. It actually very clearly spells out, you should go get the configuration settings, look at them, and make sure they're, they're set properly. So it eliminates ambiguity. And it goes back to the, the, the analogy I made a couple of times of it's a test where you know all of the questions in advance. That's especially true for a PCI DSS audit where you can look at that standard and you know exactly what the auditors are going to do when they show up. So if you're up for a PCI DSS audit, you should never be surprised by the tests that the auditors perform. They're all spelled out right there in writing for you. So if you're being audited against a different standard, and many standards are not anywhere near as detailed as PCI DSS and don't have completely documented audit procedures, they might have requirements, and then it's up to the auditor to interpret them and decide how to, how to implement the audit. But you, you should ask the auditors about the tests they're going to perform, and a good auditor will freely share this information. And I think there, there really shouldn't be any secrets or surprises involved in an audit. Everybody should be on the same page about what's being done to have this understanding of the scope and, and know what what tests are going to be performed. So the last point on this, uh, on this tip is that you really should also understand the process that auditors are going to follow to audit your environment once you've agreed upon that standard. So this might vary depending upon the, the type of audit you perform, but it will probably include a few common components, and it's how you handle all these logistics. So first, you should definitely have a kickoff meeting, and that should involve, at a minimum, the auditors who are going to be conducting the audit, the management team from your staff, and whatever other key stakeholders need to be involved. And this kickoff meeting is your opportunity to address questions about the scope of the audit or the process that's going to be followed. And you can also use this to agree upon the, the procedures and protocols that are going to be used during the audit. So for example, if the auditors want to interview members of your staff during the engagement, how are those interviews going to be arranged and conducted? Who's going to be responsible for scheduling them? Will someone from management be present during the interview? You, you can go through all these sorts of things and just make sure that you, you agree on how it will be done and have a common understanding so there isn't confusion as you, as you go through the process. You should also have regular status meetings throughout the audit, so to touch base on how the process is moving forward. And the auditors can use these meetings to informally share preliminary findings with you and, and get information. And this is really a great way to kind of have a back and forth dialogue and make sure that you're dialed into how the audit is moving along and how it looks things are going. And if, if you think things are getting off track, you can do a mid-course correction. Another important thing to agree upon as you're ironing out the process is how any critical situations are going to be reported. 
So if the auditors find evidence that there's large-scale malfeasance or some kind of critical security risk or any other urgent finding that they come across, you definitely don't want them to wait to write those up in a report because you need to take immediate action, right? These are situations where you want something to stop or start right away. So you should be clear about how this process will work. You know, within what time frame will the auditors let you know that they found this sort of thing and, how, and who and how will be informed of the, of the finding. And then once the auditors finish their work, it's customary for them to prepare a draft report and share it with you for comment. So you, you, you shouldn't expect them, because they won't, change, to change the report because you don't like the way something reads. But it gives you an opportunity to correct any factual errors. If they've actually made mistakes or they, they didn't understand something properly. Or maybe you can suggest someplace where the auditors may have overlooked a control that's, that's important and material to the process. So once you make these suggestions, it's up to the auditor to decide how they want to incorporate that information. And then if it's necessary, I've certainly seen many cases where the auditors have conducted additional field work based upon those comments when, they, when, when you tell them that you think they've overlooked something. And then finally, at, at the end of the audit, once that report is written, you should have the opportunity to provide a management response. Now, in some cases, you might just is straight out agree with with each with some of the findings and or maybe you're going to say well we understand that's a risk but we accept it or provide an action plan for correcting some of the issues identified in the audit or if, if worse comes to worse it's your last chance to object to the finding you can document as part of the report that you don't agree with the audit you think that they misunderstood something or the or the, or the risk isn't really there or you, whatever your basis is you can, you can go ahead and state that as you, as you move forward so back to our series of tips here. My third tip is probably something that you never expected to hear from someone who's a professor, and that's you shouldn't learn anything. So I guess I feel I have to, of course, explain myself now. Uh, what I mean by this is that the audit is not the right time to be discovering new things about your environment. If you're following this solid audit lifecycle process, you really should never have that unpleasant feeling in your stomach that, you've, <laughs> that something has gone wrong that you didn't expect when you're reading the audit report. Instead, the, the report should just simply be a summary of things that you already knew and understood. So let me share with you another case study from my personal experience on this topic. It, once I was called in on a consulting engagement to assist an organization that does quite a bit of business on the web. And in fact, their website is an absolutely critical part of their business model. It gathers information from consumers that really, is, and that information they gather really is the product that the business provides. So this, this company called me in to help them after they had gone through an information security audit at, at the request of one of their customers. So one of their customers said, hey, you know, we're purchasing this information from you. How do we know that the security controls you have around the, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of that information are solid enough that we can rely upon this data? So they said, go and do an audit, and we want to see the report. And you see this happen all the time. You know, SAS 70 is a standard kind of for how you document these things and share the um, – the status of controls with, with customers. So the results of this audit that was done were, were appalling, actually. The auditors had gone and used a very common web vulnerability assessment tool that goes out and scans the website. And uh, it, w when they did that, they discovered some glaring holes in, their, in the security of their website around the, the, the way the applications were implemented. And one of those was a, a pretty significant SQL injection vulnerability. And the auditors demonstrated right in front of management that they could use that vulnerability to extract essentially everything that was stored in the database table that was the main repository of intellectual property for that company. So, of course, this is simply an unacceptable situation. In addition to highlighting a, a glaring security hole in the organization's website, it also illustrated a failed information security program. There's simply no excuse that the organization's internal security function didn't perform the same assessment and discover and correct this vulnerability prior to the auditors finding it. And needless to say, there were a few new faces around that company the next time I was on site. So that's what I mean by the idea that you shouldn't learn anything during an audit. Assessments should have already uncovered those same issues that were raised during the audit and provided you with the opportunity to remediate them. So if you do find yourself surprised during an audit, that's really an indication that you should take this opportunity to revisit how you've implemented your audit lifecycle. My fourth suggestion for success during the audit process is that you shouldn't be afraid to speak up to the auditors. 
something I always encourage people is to remember that you are the expert on your environment. The auditors have come in to perform an independent assessment, but they can't possibly gain the level of expertise about your environment, your business, and your controls that you have in the short time that they're there with you. You're really the one who knows it best. So more than likely, the auditor is either new to your organization or probably new to the business process or systems that are part of the scope of the audit. And even if it's the same auditors who did the same audit last year, time has passed. The environment has probably changed quite a bit since they were last there, and they've gone and done 25 different audits at other companies, and they've forgotten some of the details. So you should always keep this principle in mind that you are the expert. And if you get the sense during the audit that the auditors aren't grasping a concept properly, you're probably right. They probably don't understand it clearly. So it's critical that you take the opportunity to correct misunderstandings as early in the process as possible, as I mentioned this earlier. While, while you're going to have the option to address those issues in the final audit report, Everyone is better off. The mistakes are corrected before they're committed to paper. You, know, you have the chance to influence the direction of the audit and the, and the, and the findings, and the auditors will look better. Right? You, they, they certainly also don't want to be wrong and completely misunderstand something because then, then, then they come off not looking good. So as you progress throughout the audit, what I'd encourage you to do is make clarifying points wherever possible and to really kind of take the philosophy that you want to be a helpful presence to the auditors. And, and this also goes for the review of the audit report that I mentioned. You should provide comments during that review as you're going through that draft document if you think they're going to be helpful to the process. And finally, while you definitely shouldn't be afraid to use the management response to correct any errors that persist in the report, I'd encourage you to treat this as your remedy of last resort. When you write a strongly worded management response, you can't help but come across as defensive, and it really is a sign that the audit process didn't go very well and wasn't managed properly, probably on either side. So along those lines, I'd encourage you, though, to keep the conversation civil. You know, I've seen situations like this picture you see here where uh, this is not an exaggeration. Well, maybe it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you, you, you don't want to characterize your audit experience with a photo like this. So while there's a natural tension between the auditor and the auditee, you really have to strive to keep the tone civil and professional. While you might disagree, you're probably going to have to work with these people for years to come, and you certainly don't want them to view you in a negative light. That's just going to uh, come back to get you <laughs> down the road. So my fifth tip is, one, is that you should embrace audit findings. Now, at first, this might sound like it contradicts what I said earlier, that you should never be surprised during an audit. But the reality of audits is that you're always going to have some findings. In my 15 years in this field, I have never seen an auditor hand an organization a clean bill of health. And I think there's two reasons for this. First, there's always something that the auditor can pick on. You know, I mentioned PCI DSS earlier and the 40 pages of requirements. I'm sure there's not an organization on earth where you can't go through those pages and find some little thing that's being done that could be interpreted as, as not meeting one of those requirements. Then the second thing is I think that auditors simply don't feel like they've documented their job up, uh, they have, that they've documented a job properly done if they don't have something to highlight that they discovered during their assessment. It's just in human nature that you have to if, if somebody asks you to go and check to see if somebody's meeting every single one of these requirements, you have to find something that you can suggest to them to improve on. So my advice to you is that you embrace the findings that you do receive during your audit report. And go ahead and write a management response and explain how you're going to respond to each one of those findings promptly and decisively. It's the, this, this response is your chance to demonstrate to your stakeholders that you take the audit process seriously and that you're going to use it as an opportunity to improve the state of your information security program. So, I mean, let's face it, it's always helpful to have an independent set of eyes checking your work. While the audit process may be uncomfortable, it's clearly in the best interests of your organization. Even if you don't like the fact that an outsider has discovered vulnerabilities in your security posture, keep in mind that you're much better off when that outsider is someone that you paid to evaluate your controls rather than someone who's seeking to exploit them for malicious purposes. And that person's certainly not going to provide you with a, with a detailed report of their work and suggestions for improvement. 
So as we wrap up, I'd like to revisit this audit lifecycle that I introduced at the beginning of our time together. While you might tweak this to fit your own organization's culture and assessment process, it's a good basic model to follow as you prepare your annual assessment program. Use the prepare stage to identify the security control objectives that make sense in your business situation. Be sure that you're choosing controls that are reasonable, meet legal and regulatory requirements, and are well suited to your organization. As we've discussed, the assess stage is critical. This is where you're walking through the standards that you've agreed to with your auditors and making sure that you're ready for that big test. Remember my analogy when we got started, an audit is like a test where you know the questions in advance. And the assessment stage is where you make sure that you're ready to earn an A. Then, of course, the remediate stage, you have the task of reconciling any gaps between your control objectives and reality. And I think if you use this lifecycle properly, you'll not only ace your audits, but you'll use the process to maximize the effectiveness of your information security program. So I'd like to thank you for your attention this afternoon and for taking the time to join us for this webcast. I'll be back to take your questions in a few minutes, but first I'd like to turn the floor back over to Renee Bradshaw from NetIQ. Thank you, Mike. That was very, very interesting. I, I really appreciated the stories that you shared about the um, – organizations that you work directly with who were not following the audit as a life cycle model and you know what resulted as a, as a as a result of that. So I'm curious now about the IT audit processes of our listening audience. So towards that end we've got a quick poll to assess that. So if you could yeah there there's a the poll there. So think about it. Which description best fits how your organization views the audit life cycle? Do you cram for the audit? A credit, get accreditation and then forget it? Do you have a couple of yearly assessments with some remediation efforts? Do you have year-round assessments with extensive remediation? Or do you not have audits? So um, use a, you know, answer via your screen using your mouse, not the, not the Q&A functionality. And um, while we're waiting for the results, uh, Mike, based on your experience, what would you expect to see the results be when we'll see it in a moment? Well, Renee, I, I hope that we're going to see uh, year-round as assessments with extensive remediation, but um, I'm kind of expecting to see that we have a mix of some of the other options here. You know, hopefully, um, I don't think we're going to see too many people click number four. I certainly hope not, but uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in your experience, have you found that those organizations that do more assessments than not more than others do better in audits as, as a general rule? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think it's because of the kind of the, the whole idea of assessing controls and, um, and, and comparing them to the requirements it becomes institutionalized. And the organizations like that tend to make sure that they are following through this process on a regular basis and tracking their progress and they understand where the gaps are. Okay. And we've got our results. So good. We, there are a few. There's a 10% that do not have audits, but it looks like over 80% are doing a, at least a few yearly assessments. So that's, that's good news. That's good news. All right, well, I'd like to thank the audience for your participation in that poll. And I'm going to uh, charge forward and just wrap up with a couple of words about our thoughts, uh, NetIQ's thoughts on how to um, improve the, further improve the efficiency and security of your computing environment and uh, outline some steps on how to ease your compliance burden all the while meeting your business objectives. So um, taking Mike's excellent feedback and just building upon it just a little bit. So first of all, we're big planners as well, as Mike, Mike illustrated in his, his presentation. We believe you need to plan for good security. Uh, you heard Mike discuss the military team that didn't follow the life cycle approach to audits, and instead they scrambled to rush preparations for each audit two weeks before the auditor showed up. Um, the sad fact is, is that many compliance efforts, uh, many organizations are like this. Their compliance efforts tend to focus solely on meeting the audit criteria de jour rather than on minimizing the risk and improving their overall security. Um, and the sad fact is, is that because of the mandatory regulatory, of the regulatory compliance, the mandatory nature of the regulatory compliance, combined with fines for noncompliance, there are some monies. There's large portions of overall security spending are put towards compliance because there's the premise that this is going to improve security and reduce breach risk. But as we've learned through the notorious Heartland payment systems and TJ Maxx cases, which were huge credit card breaches, data breaches, 
compliance mandates don't provide protection from a data breach. The compliance mandates provide only a minimum standard. So when you think about that, I mean, are, is you, does compliance drive your security program with always, without always improving security? When security projects are focused solely on meeting this minimal set of audit criteria rather than on minimizing risk, much of the potential benefit of the funding is wasted. You know, when you allow the accredit and forget it approach, much like the military team, to drive security policies, it, it, it always ends in, in badly. It, if you do this, it's like cramming for an exam to bring up the exam again. You may pass the exam, or the audit in this case, but you're unlikely to retain the benefits you would have gained from careful study and planning. So, you know, as Mike discussed, focus first on minimizing risk and improving your security. Leverage those audit findings and then define the security tools and controls up front, which align to your risk tolerance and business objectives. If you do this, you'll improve your security posture. The highly effective security team is going to direct compliance efforts towards a comprehensive risk mitigation program that is aligned with the risk tolerance and business objectives of their organization. And by doing this, by focusing on security first, the overall posture of, this, of the security posture of the organization will be improved and compliance is achieved as the byproduct of security efforts. Secondly, Seek to ease your compliance burden by creating an adaptable, flexible compliance program. You heard Mike discuss the case where he was involved with in which the auditors and auditees did not explicitly agree on the standard before the audit began. They also had disastrous results. Similar, similarly, we hear from organizations that have multiple and competing industry standards and mandates which they need to address. Often with limited resources, they struggle to meet the requirements of these standards and mandates. Which mandate should I address first? Which one is most, most prescriptive? So we believe the best way to achieve and sustain compliance with regulations such as PCI DSS is to implement, agree upon, and manage to a harmonized set of controls that meet all of your evolving regulatory and internal mandates. When you leverage this common set of controls, this simplifies your audits and provides a framework for audit reporting based on how the controls map to a given mandate. And as the regulatory environment evolves, controls can be added to the common set, allowing the organization to quickly adapt their compliance program. The result is that you have streamlined compliance efforts and a lowered cost of compliance. Similarly, we also advise to improve your security and efficiency of the IT environment you're in by utilizing workflow automation. When you utilize workflow automation, we've found that you have the ability to reduce the human error in highly routine or labor-intensive tasks. There's decreased training costs for new employees and decreased risk in highly volatile business processes um, because autom automation of these type of business processes helps ensure reliable, repeatable processes and strict adherence to policy. So I've got a a case study here to share with you as well. We work with a large U.S.-based energy company that um, implemented workflow automation and experienced improvements in the way they were able to comply with m multiple mandates. By um, They automated their attestation of group rights, which saved their AD administrators at least a one week's worth of man effort, because it, and it also removed room for error and left them more time to do interesting things. They also automated their user account provisioning. And this helped them to accurately and rapidly create and modify user accounts, especially at their call centers, which had 100% annual turnover. And this reduced the ability of any one of those employees to abuse their privileges. So in the end, we found that, especially with this company and other companies we work with, that workflow automation helps improve their security, improve their operational efficiencies, and streamlines their compliance efforts. There's less surprises, and they don't experience as much audit panic. So in conclusion, back to basics. We know today that data security is still critical or high priority for most organizations. Organizations are concerned about the damaging effects of data breaches on their organizations, both in the short term with fines and in the long term with loss of brand, competitiveness, consumer confidence, the list goes on and on. And their concerns about data breach costs are warranted. 
According to Ponemon's latest study for the U.S. cost of a data breach, the average cost of a data breach is $7.2 million, up 7% from last year. And while compliance mandates are designed to provide a minimum standard of security controls to protect your critical data, we know now that compliance in itself won't keep you safe from damaging breaches. What we've learned from the Ponemon studies and from the very famous Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report is that basic controls and monitoring can prevent most data breaches. So organizations should start with strong data protection, get the security basics right, and rather than being the end game, compliance be a byproduct of good security. We believe that only an integrated automated approach to compliance rooted in these sound security principles is effective, sustainable, effective, excuse me, sustainable and scalable. And we believe that this type of approach, as we've seen in some of the organizations we've worked with, helps them achieve positive long-term business impact in terms of the reduced breach risk, they avoid penalties associated with noncompliance, gain operational efficiencies, and long-term, the improved security posture. So that concludes the presentation for today. And as promised, we are going to spend some time with you guys now doing a little bit of Q&A. Okay, I have a question here. It's directed towards Mike. Uh, Mike, I've been through many audits in my career and have found that auditors are generally reasonable people. Okay, <laughs> however, once in a while you get someone who's a real jerk. Any advice for those situations? Yeah, so um, that, that's very true. <laughs> I, I, I found myself in that in that situation a couple of times. You know, it's uh, it, it's something that you don't want to happen, right? And I, I think everyone in the industry, you you always try your best to make sure you get along with your auditor. It's it, it's just good practice, and it's it's good you know good way to have a, a, nice, a nice normal relationship with someone and, and, and treat them well. But um, sometimes you do wind up in situations where the, the person you're working with just either is unreasonable or just has that terrible kind of toxic personality. So, I, I mean, I think the best advice I can give you there is, is the same that would apply in any kind of situation like this where you're having difficulty working with someone. And it's, you know, using your people management kill, skills, kill them with kindness, Try just try to make it work out. It, you, you're in a situation where you really need this person to, to to kind of get along with you at least, and, and be, at least enough to be objective about the situation. So, I mean, if, if it gets to a real extreme situation, I think it's something that you can take up with management you know, and, the, and of the audit firm. So typically there's a, you know, if, if you're the line person or the line manager who's being audited, you're working with line auditors, and there's a real difficult situation there, typically there's a there's a partner of the audit firm or something, if it's a, assuming it's an external auditor that, that maybe your boss can talk with and try to, try to work the situation out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, here's another one. This one's a little bit more specific. Mike, do you typically suggest something like SAS 70 for general business controls? Yeah, so uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with it, SAS 70, I, I think I mentioned during the during the session briefly, is it's a standard that's used for um, assessing the security controls of service providers. So if I'm a data center, data center hosting provider, for example, um, I would I would typically have a SAS 70 done where an independent audit firm comes in and it takes the description I provided of my controls. And there's I don't want to get into too much detail. There's, there's different types of SAS 70, type one and type two. And if you're if you're using these, you should definitely research that and understand those. But um, the, the auditor will come in and, and look at those controls and describe whether they've been implemented as stated in a in a type two audit at least. So I think that's a very valuable tool. And uh, you. If you're a service provider, you definitely want to get a SAS 70 audit done so that you can demonstrate to others that your your controls are solid. And those controls might be around general business practices, like like the question asked. And if you're if you're not, if you're someone who uses service providers, I mean, I think we've we, we've trained our security staff and our contractor our contracting staff here to. to pretty much ask for a SAS 70 is one of the routine questions whenever we're considering outsourcing any service. I think that's a very valuable standard to, to make use of. Okay. Okay, here's another rather specific question. We're talking about a slide. You showed a slide that pictured the regulatory landscape as a complex set of overlapping requirements. What's the best way to prepare for an audit when an organization is subject to many different laws and other obligations? 
Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Renee, I think you actually kind of addressed this well in, in your in your wrap up. Um, we, we do have this kind of sea of overlapping requirements, and hopefully, we don't have many situations where requirements actually conflict with each other. But we do have a lot of different laws and regulations and standards requiring us to do different things, and it can become very difficult and challenging to track all of those. So, I think the phrase you used was kind of a harmonized approach to compliance, and it, it, it's really taking all of these different requirements or outlining the security controls that you think are best for your organization. So what do you think you should do just out of basic sound security practice? And and then once you've done that, mapping them to uh, all these different compliance requirements. And then you can – you have the, and of course, then you have to identify any gaps between the standards, requirements, and laws, and what, and what you're doing. But then you can use that mapping to show that you're complying with the requirements and then just use verification of your controls to make sure that you're, you're complying with everything. So you don't necessarily have to do a, a PCI walk through and a HIPAA walkthrough and everything else, you can just do a control walkthrough and then have confidence that that mapping that you've done means that if you, if you, if you satisfy yourself during your, your own internal control assessment, that means you're meeting all these different compliance requirements. Okay. Sounds like a good plan. Here's another one. Are there any tips you can offer for responding to audit findings where the remediation is going to cost more in time and money than you can afford? We have had auditors who don't understand what their findings will cost to resolve. Yeah, sure. So, um, and this is exactly what the management response in an audit report is for. So, auditors will come and tell you what they think needs to be done. And I guess it's, it's so. The, the, the specific answer depends upon a little bit upon the context, too, and what type of audit it is, and particularly whether it's an audit for. You know, it, it, an assessment of the controls that you've decided are necessary, or if it's like PCI or something like that where the, the auditor is just saying you're not complying with a law or regulation that you're required to comply with, it's a little different. But the management response is where you can talk about um, risk, right? So there are four different things you can do when you face a risk. You can you can take action to mitigate the risk, which is probably what the auditor is asking you to do. You can transfer the risk to someone else by buying insurance. You can avoid the risk by changing your business practices. Or the fourth thing that you can do is you can accept the risk. You can say, yes, I understand that. We know we have this control deficiency, but we think that given the cost of, of implementing that control, that it's, it, it's simply not – cost-effective and we're willing to accept the burden of that risk based upon that analysis. Okay. So let the management response kind of help you out in that situation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Here's another one. This one's interesting. Um, I've encountered a situation where over-concern with security actually seems to produce a less secure environment. For example, non-single sign-on in many different password policies for different systems, and they're just looking for a comment here. Can you comment? Hmm. Yeah. So I, I'd be curious uh, to, to know more of the detail around that specific situation. I know we can't get it, but um, mm-hmm. it, it, I can't imagine a security requirement that would say you couldn't use single sign-on. And um, even with different – so certainly different regulations and different standards might have different ideas about password strength. You know, some might say – eight characters, alphanumeric, some might say you have to have a symbol, and there's all these different things. But I, I would think this goes back to the harmonization, that you should be able to find a middle ground, that, or not even a middle ground, you should be able to find a standard that you can use for your organization that meets all of those different mm-hmm. requirements. And, you know, I, I've never, I've not seen people using, like, you have to have 15 character passwords or ridiculous things like that. But... Um, if, if you can if you can appeal to the and meet the, the the most stringent of the standards, I don't know why you couldn't use a system like that for single sign on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think I think the harmonization would work here too as well. Okay, we're getting towards the top of the hour. We can take a couple more questions here. Um, let's see. Well, here's one. Hmm. Mike, what are the most frequent findings in a typical IT audit? Oh, well, you know, I don't know that there is a typical IT audit. <laughs> as, as I think back to, um, yeah, as, as I think back across a lot of the audits I've been involved in, you, you do see some themes, I guess. One I've seen a lot of recently is uh, software development lifecycle. You know, I shared one of the stories I shared was about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. But um, you, know, you see auditors looking at that quite a bit now in places where custom code is being developed. Um, I also see a lot around account management, so you know the, the just the practices that you follow for provisioning accounts and um, deprovisioning accounts, especially. So you know, the, a lot of the time you see an auditor come in and say to HR, "Give me a list of the last 
20 employees who've been terminated or all of the separations within the past six months, and then they go and check if they still have accounts and, you know, if the practices aren't right and the business process isn't being followed properly, you uh, you wind up with some discrepancies there. Mm-hmm. Then um, reviewing logs, monitoring is probably another big one because that's kind of the boring part of security and people right. tend to overlook it. Right. All sorts of different things. But then in the case, you know, if automation of the, of the, of the specific, some of those tedious workflows might be able to help like with the user provisioning to make sure that it's, you know, that it's, that it's made, it's simplified and also made, you know, as streamlined as possible so that you don't have administrator level folks doing that type of type of work sure, sure. can help as well. Right, absolutely. Okay, um, let's take this last one. Um, do you recommend the self-assessment before the audit visit or simultaneously? Um, well, I guess if you want to be able to make changes, you'd have to do it before, right? So I don't know how much value would there would be in doing an assessment during the time the audit is going on because you're just going to discover the same things that the auditors are discovering at the same time. So, But it goes back to the life cycle, right? So you don't necessarily want to pair the uh, tie the assessment directly to the audit. You want to be doing these assessments continuously to make sure that whenever you get audited, you're ready for it. But, I mean, if specifically if you're facing the situation where an audit's coming up and you want to do an assessment, I would certainly think you'd want to do that in advance to give yourself a chance to correct any issues before the auditors come. Mm-hmm. I can't. I mean, I can't think of a situation where you want to do it simultaneously. Right. Actually. You're just going to get a report that tells you what you just learned. Right. Yeah. That's kind of limited there. So, okay. Um, I think we can actually sneak in one more. Oh, this one's interesting. Uh, you mentioned there are always findings after an audit. I understand this from my experience, but my boss has the unreasonable expectation that we should come out squeaky clean. How can I expect him to get this point? <laughs> well, you're right to say that this is an unreasonable expectation. I, I mean, I'd kind of turn the tables a little bit and ask your boss to point to an audit report that he's seen in the past that came without any findings, and I, I, I doubt he's going to be able to find one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, Another thing you might be able to do if maybe this is someone who's not familiar with IT is draw a parallel to the organization's financial audit, you know, if you're in a publicly traded company or whatever other kinds of audits this person might have experience with. And maybe they'll be more familiar with that and kind of realize that findings are inevitable. So I, I would think what I'd encourage that person to do is instead of focusing on the existence of findings, which is not necessarily the most important thing, they should focus on the severity of those findings, so how how bad were they, and then also um, repeat findings. So what you wouldn't want to see is if there's a finding in this year's audit that the auditors would come back and have the same finding again next year. Right. That sounds good good advice. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question, I'm hoping, here. Okay, actually, no, that's a similar question. Okay, well, with that, I think we've, we're coming up to the top of the hour. So I'd like to thank everyone that has remained with us uh, to, the, to the bitter end, and hopefully you've um, had a chance to enter the survey and get a chance to win that Apple iPad. I want to thank everybody for joining us, and I'd especially like to thank um, Mike for joining us here today as well. Very interesting, uh, entertaining, and informative. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Renee. It was my pleasure. Okay. And with that, um, I wish you all a good afternoon, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye.